Thank you for your patience. Uh, and thanks to um, our host here at the university and to Barbara um, for starting us off and, and also to uh, Tamara and Tim Zim and Philip for their organizing. Um, I'll dive right in. Um, the, the talk I'm giving today is called City of Events. And it focuses on the city that I live in, which is Philadelphia and a northeast uh, part of the US, um, in between Washington, DC, and New York City, for those of you who haven't been there. And I'm going to focus on one place, a boulevard. Um, and the boulevard on your um, top right, it sort of ends with uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And then on your bottom left, it uh, begins um, with City Hall, the, the municipal um, services building for the city. And then we'll just move across the parkway, across time of about five years, and locations of different sites and institutions along the parkway. The nearby expressway was impassable because of the flooding river, getting as close as two blocks away from the parkway. My bike commute was on high ground, and I still saw workers on the parkway setting up for the music festival. A colleague had to be taken from her apartment in a dinghy boat. My work was canceled, but I had already arrived there early before knowing. My students could not get to school, so we decided to meet online with our guest speaker, as rescheduling is always a hassle. We've been hearing about Hurricane Ida for days in the Gulf Coast, but nobody was prepared for the post-tropical cyclone that it evolved into as it hit center city of Philadelphia. The response was a mess, an unrehearsed improvisation trying to adapt to the disruption of our everyday lives. As the water inched towards the music festival arrangements and speculation grew about a cancellation for the second year in a row, it cast the Benjamin Franklin Parkway's function in a new light. It's a curious corridor in the city of Philadelphia, at once a traffic corridor and also a park and a connecting device between numerous major cultural institutions, including libraries, museums, and schools. With local governments, home, city hall on one terminus and the Philadelphia Museum of Art on the other, the parkway itself also boasts a range of calm and hectic moments that capture a great deal of the complexity of the city, as much as any centrally located uh, neighborhood where not that many people live uh, can account for. We'll rewind back to 2018. The main branch of the city's library sits a bit further down the parkway from where the flood and music festival zone was. It's typically busy, but today in this room, time has slowed down. There, the curator, Yolanda, sat in every chair in the six rows of a semicircle to make sure that it felt right. If they weren't, then people couldn't see and then they either leave the library and feel like they weren't following. For an hour, the microphones were tested, lighting was tweaked, the projection color corrected, and the chairs rearranged. This is what it looked like to transform a bland library banquet hall into an Afrofuturist celebration for one night only. And then this is increasingly what it looks like to work at a library. Discussion at the rehearsal ensued about who would welcome people to start, or if they could just dive right into the music, films, and poetry they had planned. And was there a way that the band could lead the audience out onto the patio at sundown so that DJ Moore Mother could catch them by surprise, connecting the art going on inside with um, the city outside? and to the solar system above. Quote, of all of our metrics last year, the only category that substantially increased was event attendance, reflected librarian and event coordinator, um, Adam. 
For Adam, this often looks like partnering with an outside organization, hosting author readings, or initiating their own programming that connect the library's resources to a current event or local community. As fewer books get checked out, there is a growing expectation that librarians will activate the building and the collection and the programs in order to get people through the door. Events are things that happen. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy identifies four commonly agreed upon types of events. Activities, accomplishments, achievements, and states. While this field of thought is not conclusive in any way, shape, or form, defining events and identifying ways to mark the passing of time is both our constant preoccupation and always out of reach. Philosophical debates about what constitutes events in history from the highly personal to world historic events have preoccupied scholars grappling with the convergence of cause and effect on people and environments. How events are recognized on the scale of someone's life is a matter of preoccupation. What does the child perceive to be significant as they grow as compared with, compared with how the parent narrates their life in a baby book or on social media? And what experiences do we look back on from our deathbeds and infuse with meaning? These intimate daily examples and the events produced for cultural institutions both sit in contrast to the conceptions of philosopher Alain Badou, who insists that the event cannot be intentionally produced because it is an authentic expression of revolt or revolution. And while Badou and other theorists of events do not account for the very literal role of the event organizing, it could be beneficial to do so. If our social history is narrated through a history of events, technological and political revolutions, and our personal lives are the same, births, weddings, graduations, deaths, don't those events require some kind of facilitation? And if so, then what implication could this have for cultural producers who want to produce authentic experiences for the public within their art spaces, schools, parks, libraries, or institutions? Schools make education, libraries make research, and parks make playing, but increasingly, they also make events. And by extension, the people that work, study, and play in those environments are increasingly asked to organize and attend events. Some of these events are as mundane as discovering a provocative book while wandering the library's book stacks or kicking a ball in the park with friends, all non-events until retold or captured by documentation and made into official events. There are also a myriad of ways to go about event organizing, from intentionally casual to strategically spectacular. Many events involve an increasingly complex array of public and private entities and facilities in order to produce events for our consumption, participation, and engagement with tickets, rental fences, and professional facilitation distinguishing the field between inside and outside the event. Across scales and contexts, this range of activities has rendered, has rendered cities into veritable event factories. And while this busyness often runs counter to the more quiet and conventional uses of these spaces. A casual online search for event planning sends one swirling through an entire universe of contrived and often expensive ways to produce events. The United States Bureau of Labor Statistics tries to track the field, but does not collect data on self-employed event producers, identifying a diverse range of activities from, quote, promoters of performing arts, sports, and similar events, to traveler accommodation um, as belonging to this amorphous field. And increasingly cultural organizations ranging from theaters to poetry magazines and the individual artists they work with have shifted towards entrepreneurial models of 
special event production as the primary means of generating attention and engagement, raising revenue, and cultivating brand awareness. Examples range from the self-organized exhibits and performances that have long been a feature of independent arts communities to the more codified roles outlined in a recent job posting for a community engagement and programming coordinator at an arts organization in Delaware, nearby to Philadelphia. The posting for the job required that the applicant work 40 hours a week plus many nights and weekends for $20 an hour to, quote, manage on site all programming and events, including setup and breakdown, vendors and artists, assist in building highly building collaborations and cultivating partnerships, facilitate community and partner interaction, identify potential community partners, and build lasting and reciprocal relationships. Last part, the last part. Um, this highly complex job advertisement and the scene described at the free library was not unusual. Down the parkway, there are also three art museums and two science museums, all grappling with the emerging field of public engagement. The Philadelphia Museum of Art is known to many as the site of the fictional Rocky and now Creed characters doing their boxing training on the steps. It's known to art historians for the unmatched Duchamp collection and known to others as the Temple on the Hill. In recent years, the museum, like many, have been attempting change. As the chair of the board of directors of the museum recently rose, we increasingly have a diverse audience at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It is no longer the big edifice on the hill frequented by the elite. It's a people's museum, and joyfully so. End quote. Ask anyone who's been on the inside, and they'll tell you that this transformation from edifice to people's museum is not a complete one, despite the board members' enthusiasm. The museum sector has struggled to diagnose the inaccessibility, at times variously theorizing admission prices, representational limits of the collection, lack of interpersonal connections and affinity with new audience members, and logistics like hours and transportation options. This process takes time, and in many cases, calls for new skills and commitments not previously held by the institution. It looks diverse in its form and the path is dependent on the particularity of the institution. Sometimes it's a suite of inclusive public programs held at the museum that engage current discourses or historically excluded audiences, and at times it exceeds the walls altogether. One of the museum's former curators, Amanda Storka, recently took on a collaborative organizing of hundreds of events with over 150 collaborators in the city-wide project and exhibition led by artist Jonathan Heister. Soroka reflected that one of the biggest challenges for the museum was to accept the diversity of form, sharing that, quote, it means being able to hold a protest, a streetwide marketplace, and a shared meal with the same weight, the same value, the same worth, even though those events might manifest differently." End quote. In her fantastic 2019 report, Becoming Civic Museums, Almudina Queso outlines the rise of this kind of practice internationally. In this context, if museums do not pay attention to the current conversations, she says, they risk becoming irrelevant, not mattering to the people, becoming outdated in their representation of a society that was, but that no longer exists. Relevance is at stake. In my encounters with institutions like those on the Parkway, staff have consistently remarked about the frantic pace of their event organizing practices. Unfortunately, hosting the really unique nighttime dance party engagement event does not relieve you from the workday hours of tracking a budget or writing a program description. 
and as organizations struggle to produce high profile and urgent reasons for the public to put something on their calendars, this race towards programming frequently leads to questions about mission drift and the tension between back office maintenance and spectacularly entertaining events. In the classes I taught for many years on the parkway um, from the Philadelphia Museum of Art and Moore College of Art and Design, and now in my new role at the University of the Arts, just a few blocks away, training students with the skills to enter institutions at this moment has introduced questions about what kind of training is required to be an event worker. Most of the people working in these places have fairly traditional training like art history or library science, which introduces generational tensions around someone who might be a good administrator, but not a good meeting facilitator or dance party organizer. Of course, we want these students to have current skill sets required to get jobs upon graduation, but there's another la layer of training which is hard to pinpoint. Is it possible to be the community engagement organizer while also insisting or while also instilling a critical literacy in how events work for audiences? Could this help audiences become more self-aware that they are being engaged by professional event planners and lead them to see more authentic experiences? At art schools like the ones I've worked at, Internal events are characterized by both the necessity of extracurricular activities that expand an educational experience for students and the need to draw in members of the public to the galleries and lectures. At one town hall meeting with more college, at more college with the students, administrators proposed a slew of, di of special diversity and inclusion events to counter some recent racist incidents. One student, Liz, stood up and pronounced, we do not need more special events, but only to pick the people who care about fighting racism will attend. We need to meet the confused students where they are at and where they are required to be in the classroom. You can organize all the special events you want, but they will not get at the root cause until you make it the required conversation. It wasn't that the student wanted fewer events, but she was making an argument about their assumed value in place of required activities that implicate everyone. And shouldn't all organizations strive to be more thoughtful about the strategic deployment, um, when and how they use certain forms, and when they focus their resources on their core functions? Fast forward to 2020. A friend from the local parks advisory group who oversees the parkway reflected that while they try to support make some neighborhood parks to do more programs, they also worry that some of the parks are so over-programmed with events that they aren't able to just be parks. And in a recent report reviewing the appropriate uses of the parkway, the authors reflected that despite most uses being recurring annual programs, that the quote, the perception exists, however, that events have increased significantly, accompanied by a sense that the parkway is overused. In addition to those annual programs, the parkway is also staged for the city's most iconic demonstrations. On May 30th and June 6th of 2020, the parkway became a stage for what has become variously known as the George Floyd protests uprisings and riots. Following the circulation of video documenting the terrorizing public murder of a black man named George Floyd by a white Minneapolis police officer on May 25th, 2020, long-standing organizing around police brutality merged with spontaneous protests and revolt. I Can't Breathe was heard amongst the tens of millions demonstrating across the country Echoing the words of a struggling Eric Gardner as he cho was choked to death by a, a police officer in New York City in 2014. Not to be outdone by a virus, activists in Philadelphia seized upon the moment of 2020 to launch an action on the parkway 
that was both timely and a long time coming. The group Philly Socialists tweeted on June 10th, 2020, that, quote, the Workers' Revolutionary Collective and Occupy PHA, which is the Philadelphia Housing Authority, Public, Public Housing Authority, have begun an encampment at Von Collin Memorial Field at the intersection of Spring Garden Street and Pennsylvania Avenue. They need bodies in the ground to hold it down. Please make it if you can, they said. The city was already struggling with large numbers of houseless residents and the economic fallout of the pandemic made it all worse. After uprisings activated long-standing campaigns advocating for black life and against racism and police brutality, organized use the energy as a chance to launch the occupation. The goals included access to permanent housing, and support of current efforts to develop tiny house building. Over four months, the infrastructure of the encampment grew to include a kitchen with running water and portable toilets, rows of tents for long-term residents, meeting areas, and a wide network of solidarity workers who deliver donated food on a daily basis. A banner reading Housing Now and Black Lives Matter was unfurled across a major intersection. The slogan, I Will Breathe, was painted on the street. One of the recurring events that would typically take over the entire parkway for a week um, was that fall's Made in America Festival was canceled with the organizers, who include Jay-Z and Beyonce, writing that, quote, 2020 is a year like no other. We are in a pivotal time in the nation's history. Collectively, we are fighting parallel pandemics, COVID-19, systemic racism, and police brutality. Now is the time to protect the health of our artists, fans, partners, and community, as well as focus on our support for organizations and individuals fighting for social justice and equality in our country, end quote. In such a prominent part of the city, it was an undeniable and powerful assertion of the dispossessed in the terrain of the cultural playground of the parkway. By October, the organizers reached a deal with the city and disbanded, though many parts of the deal have yet to play out years later. Still, the highly visible event seared the potential for such actions into the minds of local residents. for a couple of years, 2022. 2022 was a busy time on the parkway. In April of that year, I hosted a common ground uh, conference uh, called Inclusive Museums, which included walking tours of three parkway museums, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Barnes Foundation, and the Academy of Natural Sciences. At each stop, the staff highlighted the relationship between an increased emphasis on public engagement and their historical orientations and missions regarding research, preservation, and exhibition. In a talking circle held after the tours, one commentator discussed the irony of the leadership prioritizing engagement while their internal culture was decaying due to unfair labor disputes, due to labor disputes, unfair labor practices. A few months later, at a museum, museum as a, a few months later at a music festival celebrating the Independence Day of the United States in July, two police officers on a security detail were shot in what was originally mistaken for fireworks. Their injuries led to thousands of people panicking, the parkway being evacuated, and soon after the inquirer the main daily newspaper in, a, in the city ran a headline, crowd concerns, shootings have some rethinking big events. Several months later, the Made in America Festival returned in full force, but with additional security. And by October, there was a new form of event rippling across the parkway. Starting September 26th, the Philadelphia Museum of Art Workers Union went on strike, 
picketing at the entrances of the iconic museum and their sister museum, uh, which is called the Rodin Museum. For 20 days, the museum sat out their picket lines and attracted an immense amount of support from local and national labor unions. They became icons for workplace organizing at museums across the country who are recognizing the disconnection between their own working conditions and the rhetoric of institutions attempting to be more inclusive with their exhibits and programs. And by October 16th, they had a contract. The next weekend, a small group of us gathered and securing audio pieces in our ears commenced on a walking tour of the parkway led by Susan Wheeler, the self-described queen of the parkway. Wheeler, a partner at the landscape architecture firm Olin, has worked on the master plan for the parkway and developed numerous design and planting projects for institutions, including the Rodin, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Barnes Foundation. Through the decentralized audio broadcasts, we walked amidst traffic, tourists, and joggers while Wheeler shared her historical insights into our earpieces. She recalled that the 2006 master plan was really when the idea of a cultural campus was solidified, suggesting that 100 years after the creation of the parkway, it was still being planned because it was a dynamic place. When developing the master plan, there was a concept of an event a minute that would punctuate the movement from City Hall to the Art Museum. As we walked to the Barnes Foundation, we passed an organization called Helping the Homeless that distributes meals and clothing to houses people living near the parkway. Moving towards the Barnes campus, there was a discussion about how the site had been formerly the Youth Study Center a juvenile detention facility for youth awaiting court hearings and was open on that site on the parkway in 1952 until 2008 when it was relocated to West Philadelphia. She feared that one of the design goals was to create an exterior entrance to the museum, to the Barnes Foundation, that lets you drop your shoulders and relax. As we looked at the fountain that Olin had designed for the Barnes, Wheeler celebrated the reflexivity of the sky and the dappled light revealed in the water. A Segway tour rolled past along the sidewalk. When asked about a chain link fence that was added to the exterior of the building, clearly, clearly after the design process was complete, she suggested that it was a response to, quote, over-programming on the parkway and mega events. In May 2023, I taught my final courses in the parkway, across the street from the free library, and a few blocks from where the encampment took place, and where the museums continued to rethink audience engagement. Both the pandemic and the protests completely altered the landscape of events in the city. The pandemic completely severed the event production at cultural institutions, and after an interval of lockdown, an interval of online programs, and an interval of physically distanced outdoor experiments, there was a slow return to in-person arts programming concurrent with localized vaccination rates, and now basically a return to normal. And today, all organizations are compelled to foreground equity and racial justice as themes to represent, even if they don't have the deep commitments to realizing them materially through redistributive means. An institutional event calendar does not typically be, get rewritten or revised to respond to current events. Sometimes when a protest is threatened against them, they cancel for fear of embarrassment. Or instances of inclement weather lead to postponement. But the general model remains. They set the calendar and their audiences are expected to fall in line. Artists in turn take these opportunities to collaborate with institutions in the production of engaging events. This role situates them, 
and I'll say us because I've been this artist, within an intersection of the two poles of socially engaged institutions, engagement workers stretching their roles to make their institutions seem relevant on the one hand, and organized workers fighting for better working conditions on the other. My own political consciousness has been shaped by relationships, ideas, and events. Relationships draw my attention to a place or struggle. Ideas about how power really works are confirmed, complicated, and punctuated by disastrous events like 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Maria, or COVID-19. These events were surprises, and as catalyzers, they have created their own micro-generations and eras, and every era shapes politics, and it's also shaped by politics. Looking forward, I hope that practitioners and scholars alike can consider how a whole disruptive events like the flooding of the river or the pandemic alongside the event production that has come to define cities and spaces like the Parkway. How might the best laid plans of music festivals or community engagement activities at cultural institutions be reconsidered in relationship to, to social reality, unfolding in both quietly mundane and shockingly violent trajectories? How can art's ways of seeing be expected? Be, how can art's ways of seeing be expanded to ways of living that are sensitive to the events we cannot predict but know to expect? And that's, thanks. Thank you, Matthew, very much. Thank you for bringing us the landscape of the part of the that is the first part. We've got still 20 minutes for questions, comments, staffing. So, yes. Not I would read that aligned. <laughs> um, could you discuss a little bit more like your units with I, I work in museums and all kinds of historical figures and the discrepancy essentially for what you said like for workers that are publicly engaged who are more of a diverse staff and their age versus um the people the decision makers who the Mellon Foundation are overwhelmingly white. So I've seen like the trajectory of like kind of being more inclusive and forming these enthusiastic committees and which are usually made up of people of color and their recommendations, their discussions, the extra labor that takes with it's not really being addressed by the decision makers who are still overwhelmingly monolithic in terms of views and and so they have in a sense, you know, like a lot of museum workers. That have been in the field that come from a certain class because they can't afford the master's degree and the internship and all these things to get a job in the museum. And so, I, 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 yes, yeah, so I, I felt like we were finally moving forward. And now it seems like there's a backlash against all these DEI committees and museums trying to be more inclusive. They really like the relevancy that they have in the community that they're trying to. I don't know what my question is exactly, but it's just like a lot of thoughts in my head. My own experiences are taking me a lot of thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I'll uh, just in the in this spirit of sharing our, our resource from people in the field, you know, I, I would encourage you to to look for there's a, a series of discussions that have happened online with you know, recorded um, that are relevant. It's kind of one of the like, kind of the beyond statements revisited. 
And what it, it what it's looking at is uh, this is a, put on by the Association of Art Curators, and and essentially it's a revisiting of a series of panel discussions that happened in 2020 that were called Beyond Statements that were about like you know going beyond statements about solidarity and racial justice and and these and these kinds of things, and then the revisiting is what's happening in 2023 and. Having attended some of these, and one was moderated by a colleague of mine, Monica Montgomery. One of the things that was striking about it, about the revisitation of of these discussions from 2020, three years later, was that many of the people, um, you know, who were are these museum workers, as we described, uh, really were. I mean, they were quite um, depressed, you know, about the advancements that had occurred, um, and a lot of it was happening. You know, they felt like on the level of programming, but not necessarily on the level of um, sort of structural reorganization. There's more, they say a lot more, it's, you know, it, it's uh, it's an elaborate, you know, exploration, but I would encourage you to see what that right now. Thanks. Uh, and maybe I just wanted to extend that to the universities within this, which is what you say my university has now branded itself the University of Social Purpose while all this stuff was rushed. <laughs> 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 um, the hypocrisy of it is, is so for me, this whole project was essentially woke washing why we call it. Um, sorry to say that, but uh, you know, I feel very uncomfortable about my position as a socially engaged activist now operating within a university and the mistrust that universities are generated within the community that they apparently do to the as well. There's a mass gentrification project and all kinds of other violence against the community. I want to extend to what you're starting to probably say, not necessarily as a new question, but just to start that discussion also wider in the university. Yeah, I think well, I hope that that is able to be taken up as a as a concern in the space. Obviously, most people in the room are are in, both implicated and also exploring, you know, how to navigate those uh, questions. I'm looking forward to more about it. Um, Thank you. So I, I wonder about the history of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. You say there's a disconnect uh, between the museum and its parks. Is it because of history or events or space? architecture, the nature of it? Yeah, I would say sort of all, all of all of the above. I mean, some of it has to do with, it's certainly architecture figures into it because it, it is kind of separated, you know, largely from um, from neighborhoods. But the other part of it just has to do with a lot of the um, kind of conventions of Established in museums in the, in the era in which it was created, which is that it was, you know, was established out of collections of the elite uh, Philadelphians, and that made up its primary kind of audience and constituency for a long time. Um, and and museums are, you know, like like universities are all grappling with, you know, their relationship to their surrounding neighborhoods and cities, um, and so. That's the moment, you know, that in which they are already thinking that as well. I wouldn't say it's it's not catalyzed by anything other than you know kind of a cultural term. Um, yeah. um, my question is focused on both policy and events, particularly because here in Europe we have an event that's called Movie and Public Poker that was called Manifest and Sport. So the continent wide um, top down type of event that is uh, staged every year to stimulate museums. And in this case, as you can imagine, it's the kind of event for tomorrow. You see the kind of events that are hoping to like that become smaller and smaller and smaller, which creates even more um, challenges towards in terms of capacity building, as you mentioned, uh, but of other. Uh, elements to it because we have talked about events so we have interest in the idea that an event, a cultural event, would cause a change. But this idea that art and culture can contribute to change the economy, uh, the society, culture, and so on. But the presentation you, you, you share with us today you just introduced some central larger ideas that further in terms of demonstrations that seem to interest more dynamic from the community. 
So how how these two elements of almost top down bottom have the different um, are staging both in Philadelphia and in Brooklyn? Do you have any sense in how that's been changing or shaping the scene? Um, yeah, thank you for your question. I mean, yeah, I've been interested in this, the, the European um, kind of trend of these, you know, of these city-based, uh, you know, programming initiatives um, for a long time because it seems, you know, it's a little bit like the Olympics of cultural policy, you know, in that sense, and it seems to have the power to really uh, remake um, a lot of kind of urban space. Um, in terms of, you know, in terms of the context of the U.S., I mean, it's a, a different. I, I think actually, you know, that would it would not be a, a bad uh, initiative to kind of you know appropriate in some way because it's it at least gives some kind of structure to this uh, you know um, this kind of initiative. In terms of the kind of you know relationship between these two, these are what I'm exploring. I mean, I I, I find that. Most attempts by institutions to be responsive to the more kind of spontaneous events um, are, you know, they they happen too late, right? You know, there's a there's a it's, some of it is about time, um, and then on the other hand, you know, the most that um, the most the, the impact doesn't go the other way, right? It's not we just are as sort of citizens of the city, we're accepted. We're expected to just, um, you know, avoid a busy area when it turns into a festival, or you know, if we want to go on on about our daily lives. And so, I'm interested in this, the tension and the potential relationship. I don't feel that I have any like solutions exactly in terms of the way in which um, institutions can be more responsive to the calendar of you know society versus you know uh, the other way around. Um, but it's a, it's an important tension that that animates daily life in a city, whether it's a European you know center of culture or one of these um, you know top down initiatives, or it's something that you're just have to use the park way. You know the reason I started writing about this, um, and I should say this is a work in progress, so I appreciate your reflections because I'm I'm still trying to figure out where to go with this. But is that a uh, the reason I started writing about it was because this was just my commute, right? So my bicycle route, you know, would be every few days or every few weeks, you know, you'd see sort of a different crew of people setting up some temporary fencing or some some portable toilets and kind of wonder like, okay, what is this thing that has nothing to do with my daily routines? But, you know, it's obviously going to be really important to the people who are running a marathon or are attending a music festival or attending one of these, you know, kind of activations at a museum. Um, so, you know, that that relationship is, you know, I think uh, it became a starting point for me. It was just dealing it on a daily basis as a, as a So, uh, I thought I'd just offer a chance to explore the uh, I work at these museums and galleries in the UK, and our UK context is very different to the US one. Take that point. But about 18 years ago, the service decided to make a complete shift and turn everything on its head. So, from what I said before, so every program is co curated, every event is co curated, uh, the interpretation of collections, the distribution of space and power, that kind of thing. But more recently, introducing the bond programs, which is shifting the other workflow. We still have a long way to go, so I'll say that. But in terms of our strategic plan, it's now centered on care, care of people, care of places, care of objects. So it's over the 19 years, so look at Barbara and earlier, we were talking about care of ethics. Could you talk a little bit more about care and how you see those organizations as caring? What yeah, it's, um, yeah it's, there's a lot of overlap, I think, with the stuff that Barbara shared. Um, so, this project that I mentioned, uh, Philadelphia Assembled, uh, I didn't name it, but it was the one that was initiated by uh, Jonathan Heister. He's a Dutch artist um, who came and did a three year residency in, in uh, Philadelphia. 
Um, it was organized along these uh, these five principles. Um, I'll read them for you. Futures, sanctuary, movement, reconstructions, and sovereignty. I think that, you know, this project is just what I'll use to answer your question, um, which is that the, this project, while it didn't talk about care, it was largely, I think, organized in a, in a caring and considerate manner in terms of a lot of attention, a lot of labor was put into the relationships. There was 150 partners um, and then kind of a core group of about 30 people. And for a year, there were events that happened throughout the city and the, you know, to use your your uh, term of co-curation, there was a, that was the model, right? You know, there was a, a, an opportunity to say, okay, this organization in this neighborhood, what's the thing that you are concerned with and care about? We can, how can we use the museum's resources to advance it? And this would be a year long exploration of this. Um, and in a lot of ways, it was really kind of amazing. It was quite an extraordinary stretch of these institutional resources. Um, and it, and I attended many of these events. I wrote about the project. And 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 at the end of the day, one of the um, I quite enjoyed the exhibition. They did not have one on site, but most of the things were decentralized. But at the end of the day, we didn't change that much about how the institution as a whole was organized. <laughs> it, it, it didn't change it. And, and I have and I sort of have an idea about what why that is uh is that the reason is that because they they still put the emphasis, whether it was through the marketing or the public, you know, kind of promotion of it, the emphasis was still on come to this exhibition that is about social movements in Philadelphia. And, and then, you know, that was the, that was where the attention was given, right? So even though there was great care from all of the staff members that participated in the, and the artists um, to the relationships, you know, that made up the project and to the partnerships, the, the institution as a whole still treated it as, as an exhibit on the event calendar. Um, and then, at the end of the day, they kept the next exhibit was a big Jasper Johns retrospective, right? And it was just another slot on the event calendar. And and I think that one of the things that could have reshaped or sort of re, re um reshaped the outcome of it would be to have emphasized what actually was the outcome, but was but it's sort of too subtle in a way for most. In museums to emphasize. And that is that it was effectively a leadership development program for local organized grassroots organizers and activists to kind of develop their capacity as, as organizers and, and, and leaders in the city. And out of it, you can you can you know kind of scan the, the city today, you know, several years later, this happened in 2017. You see in the city, and all of these people who were engaged in that core group, they're all doing amazing things, right? That's the outcome. The outcome is that these 30 people are now doing amazing things. But the museum would never, you know, sort of have, have put a million dollars towards a leadership development program for grassroots activists in the city, right? They had to make it an exhibition. Um, and so there's a way in which it's, there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what was actually transpiring and what the kind of key work was. So that in a way, they're not even able to celebrate the actual achievement that, you know, that did happen. But part of that is because it was happening just kind of, you know, on the edges of, of their, their official claiming. Maybe that's for the best, right? You know, it would be weird if they claimed more ownership over the leadership development and capacity building of these grassroots activists. That might be strange or inappropriate. But it does feel like there's a way in which, by not claiming or engaging it, they're also missing their ability to, you know, to change their culture. You know, which is what, of course, led to this happening. You know, five years later, um, right? This is always beneath the surface. Yeah, I, 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 I,
I mean, it, it takes a lot of work to do this, right? And I feel like part of this dilemma with institutions too is that care requires maintenance. So this constant like, uh, you know, innovation and you want a new program and you want to pop something new thing. I mean, I remember I was working with a art institution and they had a grant based on the homeless men and poverty. So they spent a year, um, their staff needs to increase to be able to shelter. They need the resources for this. And then when the grant is over, they stop. And then they move to the next thing. And so it's like, you can't, you can't jump from topic to topic. That, that's part of the definition of marriage. It's like maintenance of the budget. Yes, but don't so send me so much work. Long term, yeah. exactly what you also mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, so that also to the earlier question about the the European, you know, kind of global policy models. I mean, these are obviously the 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 models are different in different you know political and economic contexts. So you may have this kind of long build up to these European um, you know cultural festivals, and then versus in a in a American context where there's more of a you know kind of um, tradition of of philanthropy organized around, you know, topical kind of grant making that organizes things in sort of more of a choppy, you know, kind of way. Um, so I mean, I'm not. I'm sure there's limitations of, of course, to both models, but you know, there there does need to be a um, there does need to be a shift in how these programs are are resourced, um, and so that's. That also, as I understand it, you know, is sort of one of the kind of tensions that exists in the, in the British uh, context is around sort of institutionalizing some of the, um, the you know, kind of increasingly diverse uh, workforce um, into more kind of communication roles. The last one, but quick. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I'll just speak about the just to continue with the context of the of the Parkway, right? So there's, um, you know, this is a um, this is the school I was talking about on the right, more college, and the, the brick building on the left is the Academy of Natural Sciences. Um, which was the, the first uh, natural science museum in the United States. Uh, and um, the um, and I would say that you know they're they're dealing with the same questions in a lot of ways. The 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 difference is that natural history museums have a different relationship to, to people's lives, like that they might be prioritized in a in a school visit um, over an art museum. Um, and so there's a way that they might be integrated. And I would say maybe the same for history museums. So people that in a wider range of people in the city have a deeper relationship with art, with uh, you know, history and science museums as opposed to art museums for you know for various kind of localized uh, reasons in terms of arts funding and education funding. Um, that said they're still trying to figure out the culture shift, right? So they, they have a, there's a sort of, they have an advantage in the sense that, that they're integrated into people's lives at a younger age. Um, and so they don't have to over, you know, overcome sort of a barrier of, you know, art uh, institutions maybe being alienating in some, in some ways or the way that they're kind of presented for some of the reasons that, you know, Barbara's uh, lecture kind of alluded to, um, but also, um, they, but they still have their internal culture is organized in a way that allows them to be kind of engaging at a wider range of let's let's say sort of science or historical kind of questions that are obviously publicly urgent and immediately um, important. But I, I will say to their credit, I mean this institution is uh, you know was one of the first. Science museums in the U.S. to really come out and talk about climate change and their exhibitions. So you know they're they're doing good work and they and they have some quite interesting kind of arts integration um, initiatives. 
And and that's you know I think also kind of there's a lesson obviously here for you know the kind of work of public engagement. It's just the way in which art is often utilized as the device uh, for public engagement by in other disciplinary spaces, um, which brings up a lot of questions about you know sort of the the role of the, the, the potentially training artists, right? Which is sort of one of the things I was exploring in my talk, right? Is how you you know, in, in ways of train the next generation of artists who do work, say, at not at an art museum, but at a science museum where they're doing public engagement, these kind of things, but they're still obviously running up against the internal tensions of how the place is organized, um, which get down, you know, very quickly to labor, unfair labor practices, and just kind of, you know, artificially redress ways in the whole sector uh, in that environment. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Before you all speak, I just want to tell you one thing about what we do next. So we're going to have coffee, uh, the coffee and uh, tea outside. And then after that, we go into a session of five, which is the program for a talking circle. And the talking circle, each of the rooms uh, has one of the themes.